What's up, everybody? It's Lucas Barra here on the Closers Corner, which is an exciting new show that I started. I run Radical Sales Coaching, where we empower independent sales professionals like you to get the outside insights, strategies, and accountability for bringing in more sales. And that's why I started this show is because I thought it'd be really great to bring people who are in the trenches, like the gentleman that I'm talking with today so you could get some strategies and insights and inspiration to really get you going so you can bring in more business and without further ado I'm, I'm really excited to have my my buddy and guy I've known for a, a while now who I really respect he's got a, a great financial practice in the Carlsbad area of California he's a, a top producer with a a reputable company in the area and recently was elected to the million dollar round table. So he's getting it and is going to have all sorts of great insights for you guys. And that's Mr. Jonathan, Johnny Searle. What's up my man? How you doing? I'm awesome. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, sure, man. Well, it's a, a pleasure to have you and to start things off. So let's, uh, let's tell folks a little bit more about you. how did you get into, running a, a financial services practice? Yeah, that's a good question. So a little background. So I'm actually from the San Diego area originally. Um, went to school at Point Loma Nazarene down in Sunset Cliffs. I uh, actually wanted to pursue law enforcement after, and for one reason or another, it didn't work out. Um, I got a call one day from my old chemistry teacher who is actually a client of the company that I'm working with now. And he said, hey, you gotta go check this out. It might be a good fit for you at some point. Um, and so I did, so I went in, did a couple of interviews and then did a lot of research on the industry and found out that, you know, you, like you said, you can be your own boss. Um, there's a sales aspect, but really you're just helping people. And that's what attracted me to the job and really the industry. And so I decided to go with that company and, and you know, three, a little over three years later, here we are. Yeah, well, well, three years later. So, like, what's kept you in in your role for this long? I think it's it's my drive. Um, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily better or smarter than the guy next to me. I think the one thing that keeps me going is my long term game plan and my vision. Um, you know, what drives me is the flexibility down the road, spending time with my family, um, being able to travel the world. Um, I'm not necessarily driven by money, which surprises a lot of my clients when I tell them that. Um, but you certainly need money to live in this area. And so that's, that's one of the benefits or, um, you know, one of the results from doing well in this industry is money is not an issue and it creates just flexibility for, for your family and your future lifestyle. Sure. Yeah. Well, drive is such a crucial part of success in the line of work that we're in. So for guys and gals out there who are looking to find ways that they can get more on top of their their drive or maybe looking for that spark in terms of their drive what would you say is something for them that could help them to, to find that drive or kind of find that that next gear that's been helpful for you i think uh that's a good question i think the the biggest thing that's helped me is having uh that long-term vision in place so i have you know, a 20 year vision. I also have a five year vision. So I can tell you, you know, pretty detailed what my life is going to look like in five years. And I have a lot of work to do to get to that point, but I can tell you that it's going to be worth it. So, you know, we all go through ups and downs daily if you're in our industry. Um, so having something that you can, you know, take a step back and read your vision a couple of times a day, that just keeps you on track. And, you know, that, that's when you don't want to put in extra work or go back and make those extra phone calls. That's really what drives me is reading that vision a couple more times. Sure, sure. So I'm sure some folks are clamoring to hear about the, the, the five-year vision. Why don't you give them a little, little something, something from that? <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, without going too into detail, um, <laughs> we'll be running, I mean, so from a professional... <laughs> From a professional standpoint, we'll be running uh, one of the biggest practices in our system. Um, we're on the way there right now. We just got to keep building and grinding. Um, but I'd like to hire more staff along the way. Right now, we have two uh, full-time, and we'd like to increase that up to four or five. 
Um, as far as personal life, I'd like to you know own a nice home in Cardiff. That's really my dream area to live in. Um, so that I'll probably be married with you know a kid or two on the way at that point, which is crazy to think about. But five years out. Um, and then I think another thing is building the relationships with my clients. I think that's a big driver for me is building these lifelong friendships. It's not, there are certain sales industries where you sell a product and then that's really it, right? You don't talk to the client again or the customer. Um, but with our clients, we're building these lifelong relationships where they become some of our best friends. And so seeing our clients grow with us, you know, being able to invite them to events and birthday parties and, you know, volunteer opportunities down the road, that's, that's pretty exciting to um, you know, knowing that all this hard work is going to create that sort of community um, when we're a little bit older. And the, the folks that, that we work with, um, they're all, you know, anyone under the age of 30, they're all the top guys in their industry. And they're the guys that are like-minded. They're responsible. They care about their family. They're, you know, trying to save money the right way. So, you know, if you can surround yourself with a bunch of those guys, that's, that's another thing that's, uh, that's pretty rewarding from this industry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you hit on a few really great points there with one being having that that long term vision really clear is really important, especially in the line of work that we're in. It's such a roller coaster and to have that, you know, basically really defined for people out there who are listening. If you haven't outlined what you want your personal and professional life to look like, it can really make a big difference for you in terms of how you approach your days. So when you don't want to make those five or 10 extra calls, having a vision can really encourage you to do that. Having pictures near you can encourage you to do that. And also surrounding yourself with the right people, which is going to be something that we echo for actually creating more success in your career. So how, how do you go about, because you talk to a lot of people, and how do you go about kind of disseminating slash uh, figuring out who the right people are for you to surround yourself with long term? Um, there's a couple factors I look for. Um, anyone making more money than me would <laughs> be a good one. Yeah. Um, I'd say if it's a younger crowd, it's anyone that's pursuing something. Um, I think it's you know so often in our culture, and I really are our age group, people just get stuck in the day-to-day -day grind um, without actually pursuing something. So I think the guys that are working a little bit harder than the guy next to them, you know, to get to the next level. Um, another good one is if you ask someone if they're reading something or what they're reading, if they have a response to that, that's a pretty good sign that they're, you know, on a good track. So I, I try to, you know, constantly be reading something and growing my mind that way. Um, that's it. I mean, it's similar values. I mean, I meet a lot of, you know, young folks in the Christian community or, you know, going to church, whatever. Um, but just people that have similar values or taste and, you know, interests. So I, I surf too. So many people that surf and also have a good job. It's just, you know, a lot of common connection there. But I think long term, it really just comes down to, you know, if they have a vision, if they're trying to get to the next level. Um, so many folks are just stagnant. They're not trying to get there. And I think it's uncomfortable. I think it's easy to stay comfortable, um, but it doesn't necessarily help you achieve your dreams. And I heard a quote the other day that said something like, people sacrifice what they really want for what they want right now. And that's just the epitome of our culture, unfortunately. I think people settle for way less than they're capable of because it's comfortable. And, you know, I naturally uh, am not an outgoing, salesy, work hard, you know, grind kind of guy. Um, so I have to constantly every day put myself outside of my comfort zone. And yeah, I've done that for over three years now, every single day. And so I say the person I am now is night and day from the person I was when I started this business. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, I, I think it's just, you know, finding people with similar values and long-term goals. Yeah. Well, that, that's a lot of good stuff. I'm sure a few people perked up and they're like, what? Like this guy is not an outgoing salesy kind of person when he was getting into this. So talk about a few other things outside of looking at your vision that like have helped you to get outside of your comfort zone and to get uncomfortable regularly, because that's something I think all this in this space have to deal with. Like you're going to have to call on friends. You have to call on people where you're like, God, you're like worried about, how all those things are going to pan out. So talk a little bit more about how you just continue to put yourself out of your, your comfort zone. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I'd say there's maybe two parts to that question. So the, the getting outside of your comfort zone, um, 
it's just a constant decision. I think every day when I wake up, I can go back to sleep or I can get into the office and be the first one in there, Mm -hmm. Um, which I think since I started, I've always been the first guy in the office every day. Um, You know, I think it's just deciding to, to get some growth. Um, You know, if we, like I said, if you stay stagnant, you're not going to grow. So I, I have a journal um, and this is probably back because I haven't been doing this last couple of weeks. So I'm kind of a hypocrite right now, but um, I had a journal that I was keeping track of and I would try to do at least one thing a day that pushed me or challenged me. Um, So sometimes it's having a difficult conversation with someone or sometimes it's, you know, going out of your way to to help someone else and, you know, something they're going through or, or, you know, calling someone out for something or just whatever that may be, just, um, or calling on the biggest prospect that you've never called on. Um, so I think doing that enough times, you just get in this routine of, okay, this is something I can do. And the more you do that, the more it just becomes comfortable. Um, and it's not, not really so much of a challenge at that point. And as far as approaching friends in a sales role, again, I don't view myself as a sales guy. I think we're advisors and my philosophy is I'm going to provide the advice and lead them in the right direction. And then ultimately it's up to them if they want to take responsibility or not. Um, but as far as approaching friends and family, I used to be kind of against that just because I didn't want to be the guy that was bothering them. But knowing what I know now, I almost feel guilty for not approaching more friends and family than I, I currently do. Um, Cause the work I do, you know, in our industry is so, so valuable and it's almost like sharing good news, right? Like if you hear of, you know, this awesome music festival that you go to and it's the best thing and it changes your life, you're not going to just hold it in. You're going to put it on Facebook. You're going to tell all your friends about it. So kind of the same thing with our business. You know, I, I know that I can help people and I truly believe that. And, you know, if I'm not reaching out to them, then it means that they're not going to be in a better spot. And so that's really why I would say I'm doing well is I just I genuinely care about people. And so I think if we're not reaching out to those that are close to us, we're, we're failing them in a sense. Sure. Yeah. So talk more about that mind shift that you, that, that you had and, and what caused that. Cause I'm sure there are some folks right now who, really could benefit from switching into more of that service mentality or like, how, how do I, how do I do that? Yeah. Good question. So I'm still working on that. Um, it's three years in the making of uh, that mind shift change. Sure. Um, I, w- I would say, you know what, like you said, it's just a selfless act. I think if you're so concerned about calling someone or bothering someone, then that's selfish. I think if you were, if you know for a fact you can help someone, then it's, it's on you if you're not calling them. Right. I mean, when you're given a gift, I mean, I, there's that quote from Spider-Man, you know, with more power comes more responsibility, something like that. I mean, that's the same thing with what we do. You know, I know that I'm backed by a strong company and I have access to everything that can help someone with their financial picture. And if I'm not reaching out, nobody else is. So they're, you know, they need us. And I think if you're, you know, I feel like my calling is what I'm doing right now. And if I'm not helping people, then um, it's selfish. And I think when you become more of, hey, I want to help these people, not, you know, I need to get my next sale, people can see that. And if you genuinely try to help people, um, they can sense that. And that's really when my business started taking off is, you know, when I started working on that, that transition with my mindset. Yeah, man. I mean, those are such great points there, especially the, the genuine help that, you know, when you're illustrating that, whether it's through your language, whether it's through the things that you do, I think it really makes it a big difference. And I loved your point about how you, you just have to do it because at the end of the day, if you're really going to be helping someone else, you're just shorting them potentially if you're not doing the first place. And while some, some things may not go well, I think it's like you were talking about, you don't know because the people who really are going to want and benefit from this are going to wise up and want to to work with you so in the end it's certainly worthwhile yeah absolutely so now you bought up a book though i want to know what what book are you reading right now so i just finished outliers by malcolm gladwell okay so awesome book uh it's good it's interesting it talks about you know the people that do really well and you know career personal life and really what sets them apart and it talks a lot about you know their upbringing and different conditions throughout their life that um you know created kind of where they're at today so i thought it was interesting so i studied it and it's very applicable to my life just because there's certain things that happened along the way that were helpful for um you know conditioning me to be a good fit for this 
this role um, mm-hmm. that I wasn't aware of. But yeah, I'd say that's a good read. Um, another book that I think, and I know we, I think I've shared this with you, but I think everyone in their 20s should be read um, The Defining Decade by Meg Jay. That is probably the most helpful book that I've read so far. And it's so simple. Um, and I'm not a, not a salesperson for, for Meg Jay or anything. Um, that would be nice though, because um, she's probably killing it too. But anyways, she talks, she's a psychologist and she talks about the 20s being the pivotal point, you know, in your career and personal life to get ahead. And it's just the classic example of someone who's slacking in their 20s and enjoying life, which is fine. There's no judgment there. But, you know, the downside is you get to be 30 with no job experience, um, no family. It's just, you know, so you set yourself back 10 years and really when you want to try to get ahead. So that's something that I think, you know, helped me and my, my work ethic. Um, like I said, naturally, I'm kind of a lazy person. I, I'm not a go-getter. I was always kind of lazy, and it took me a lot to get through school. So having this new shift of, hey, this is the time to get ahead, and then you can pull back and be lazy down the road if you need to. I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's you know, that was helpful for me. So that, that's probably the one book I'd recommend if, you know, if you're throwing that out there to your, your younger clients, for sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, for sure. I think for anybody who's in this, in this role in their, in their early to late twenties, that could be a great book for them to check out. And what I want to talk about next is your transition from when you went from being uh, a solo act, basically to having staff, because there are going to be some people who are listening to this, who are either going through that and they are either on blo- onboarding employees or about to hire. And I want you to talk about what you, cause now you have, how many staff do you have now? Uh, two full time. Two full time. So I want you to talk about what that was like for you, bringing them on board, what you've learned, what you wish you would have known and, uh, and just expand on that. Yeah. So I don't think there's ever a right time to hire staff. Just like there's never a right time to start working out, you know, today's the best way to do it. So for me, I was given some advice from some older advisors that are very successful. And they said, by the time you think you need staff, it's already too late. Mm. So I was, let's see, I was probably a year in the business. And that's when I hired my first part-time staff member. And I was freaking out because I didn't know that if I was going to be able to pay her or not. Um, but the results paid off. I mean, I, I started doubling my production pretty quickly and it paid for itself plus more. Um, so I think my transition was, I can only grow this so big if I'm doing it by myself. You know, it, when you're dealing in our industry, there's a lot of case prep and um, client filing. It's just a lot to go through when it comes to building a financial game plan for a family. So if you can offset a lot of that work and give it to someone else to do who can specialize in that, um, I mean, ideally, I would be in front of clients all day. That's all I would do and have them do everything else. I still have to be involved a little bit on the back end just to oversee some of the processes. Um, But for the most part, they do most of the back end work so I can do what I enjoy doing, which is being in front of clients and, you know, getting to know them and building the relationship and figuring out what's important to them. That's good stuff. Yeah, I think that that hiring before you want to (laughs) goes back to being uncomfortable, right? Because... You know, you're going I mean, you never, yeah, you never feel like you're ready to do it. Yeah. So like what, got, what got you to pull the trigger? Was there someone, I know you mentioned you had some people who told you, but did you get to a point where you're like, you had like the aha moment where you're like, I'm finally going to pull the trigger or one day did you just, you're just like, I'm, I'm doing it. Like what, what happened? Yeah. I think it was just another one of those things in my, you know, uncomfortable journal. I was not ready for it, but it was just another thing to get me outside my comfort zone. And, you know, the company, that, the firm that I'm backed by right now, they actually help pay for your expenses for the first three years. Um, so technically, I didn't have to hire staff after, until after three years. But, you know, I was told, do it earlier. You know, the earlier, the better. Get used to paying staff. Get used to having them build a team for you. So... I think what helped too was I've, I've always had a coach ever since I was six months in the business, I hired a coach. So I've, I've had multiple coaches along the way. And my first real coach uh, kept challenging me. She kept saying, Hey, you need to hire someone if you're going to get to the next level, you can't do this by yourself. And I, you know, I think I'm the kind of guy that I can learn from other people's words. Um, if they're older and wiser than me, which most of them are, um, you know, and I think that's another thing that 
probably sets me apart from the guy who's not really doing well is uh, just being coachable and taking other people's advice. So I think hiring a coach is probably the first step, uh, just getting used to, you know, putting money back into my business. Um, and then hiring staff was pretty short. It was probably six months after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there were people listening to her like, well, I don't, you know, I don't need a coach or they're not coachable, right? They're, they're just think that they can do it by themselves. So what, what, how do you, what, what would you say to that in terms of people? Cause I'm sure there are people out there who are really successful, right? They're like you. So like, why, why would they need a coach? Yeah. Uh, I mean, for a couple reasons, I think number one is just to challenge you and hold you accountable. I mean, everybody's more accountable with a coach. I mean, I compared to going to the gym and working out, which is something that I also need to start doing more. Um, but when you have a personal trainer right there telling you what to do and pushing you, it's going to, you're going to get better results. Um, and I think it's interesting. One of our, one of our biggest advisors in our entire system, this guy makes more than a lot of people uh, in this, you know, in this area. And there was one time I was meeting with him as a, you know, a new rep just to pick his brain for a little bit. And I was taking a bunch of notes and then I said something that he didn't think of. And he, he actually stopped me and pulled out a notepad and started taking notes on something that I said. And so I think that was probably one of the most humbling experiences for me in the beginning of my career, knowing that this guy who's been doing this for 30 years just stopped to take notes on something that, you know, a six month new rep said. Mm-hmm. Um, so the fact that, you know, even that guy, how far he is in the business, he's still learning from a brand new guy. Um, you know, so I think in my processes, I'm probably just a mud, I'm a mixture of a bunch of good people that are in this business. And I think a coach is just, you know, another portion of that. I think they, they challenge you. And, um, I think if you don't have a coach, you, you're not doing it right, quite frankly. For sure. And as far as, so let's, let's get into some more specifics around like actually having a like in-person meeting with someone you want to talk into or talk to, to become a potential client of yours. What are some of the approaches and suggestions you might give to somebody on how they can be more effective with in-person meetings? Just a um, good question. Um, I don't think I have any specific advice. I would, I would say be a good listener. I think a lot of people in our industry or in any sales role or whatever, um, they want to share all the information that they know and act like they're the smartest guy in the room. And they probably are, um, but people don't care about that. You know, if you can ask the right questions and then shut up and just let them talk for a little bit, that's really where you're adding value is, you know, wearing a couple different hats, one of them just being a counselor and just listening and, you know, figuring out what's important to them. Um, So I think that's, that's probably the biggest takeaway I have is just be a better listener. Yeah. I mean, I want to really emphasize the part where you said you you listen for how you can help them because that there's such a big distinction between that and trying to, to sell somebody something because when you are able to listen and really understand what they may need, you can offer them something that could really benefit them long term. Right. That's great. I'm actually I'm writing that down myself because it's such an Im- important thing to remember. And as far as like, how about on the actual phone? Are there any things that you use right now that are working really well for you that you might not have used before? They're like, oh my God, like, I wish I, I wish I'd known about this before. Yeah. One of my buddies who's a big time advisor out in uh, Michigan, um, this guy just crushes it. I mean, he played in the NFL for a couple of years and did really well. And now he's an advisor. Um, but he shared with me when he was booking meetings, uh, and I might've shared this with you in the past. I don't remember, but, um, he says something along the lines of, you know, in his language, he'll say something like, like Hey, I'm not sure if you're even a candidate for what we do. Um, but I'd love to at least share the work we do in case at some point you are. And so I think by saying something like that, it doesn't need to be those words, but something along those lines, it just emphasizes that, you know, maybe they're not a candidate and people subconsciously react to that and go, well, 
no, I do want to be a candidate. Shit, what is it that you do? You know, so I think, you know, not to be like salesy, but you kind of have to play mind games with people sometimes. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you can almost like take it away from them, people want that, you know, like play a little hard to get on the phone. And, you know, it's kind of like dating, like you, everyone's just sniffing each other out and trying to figure out, you know, if they're a good fit. And, you know, that's, that's something I've been doing in my, you know, when I call people, my booking ratios is, is just skyrocketed. So that's one, one, probably one tip that I would add. Okay. And I mean, what are, what are some of the other takeaways that you use? Uh, when phoning? Yeah. When phoning. Um, I think relating it to, it, it depends. Like for us, we get, I don't cold call. I get referred to people's friends and families, um, you know, my current clients. And typically I'll just keep it going back to the nominator. You know, like if you referred me to your buddy, Joe Schmo, I would call Joe and you know, I'll just say, hey, Lucas said you're an awesome dude. Uh, didn't say you're a candidate for what we do necessarily, but said you guys are, you know, good friends and that you're a good guy. Um, I'd love to share the work I do with you and see if I can be helpful at some point. But I think putting it, you know, almost taking it off of me, again, it's it's all about not, it's being selfless, right? It, it has nothing to do with me. It's a like, Lucas found value in what we do mm-hmm. and he cares enough about you and found a difference in, you know, the work we did with him. So I'd love to share that with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that it, it comes across so much better to the other person too. I, I use something similar when I'm reaching out to, to someone with a bit of a twist on it. And I think for, you know, when you're talking about it being industry specific, I don't think that it's necessarily industry specific. It's more so about how you communicate it in a way that is going to benefit the other person that you're looking to talk with, not that particular way that you're, we're talking about right now. I think that really, it highlights the other person and that's what makes a difference for them that right. allows a conversation to happen in the first place. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I have a coach that I'm still working with and I talked to him yesterday and he was saying, you know, people don't buy similarities, they, they buy differences. So, you know, um, yeah. So if you can set yourself apart, like a lot of times when I get feedback from clients, I'll say, Hey, what was the difference you found, you know, I'm going through this process and they'll share that. And then I'll say to my next prospect, Hey, you know, your buddy found a difference in the kind of work we do. And, you know, he cares enough about you that he felt compelled to introduce us. Then, you know, it, again, it just takes it off of me. It's, it has nothing to do with me. It's, he found a difference in the process and, you know, and then sometimes I'll joke and I'll say, Hey, let's get together. And, you know, Best case scenario is maybe we can help you at some point. And worst case scenario is, you know, you get a free education and we'll blame the meeting on Lucas. <laughs> um, so I think adding a little bit of humor just to let them know you're not a robot is usually pretty helpful too. Yeah, I think that, that humor and emphasizing those differences are really important areas that, that you mentioned. I want to shift into referrals because you talked about a really important part of this business and any business where you have to, generate repeat business so for you what are some of the the tips and tricks that you use for generating referrals more effectively i don't know i was actually hoping i learned from you (laughs) um i would say you know what i'm not i don't have the best language around referrals and i tell that to everyone but um i do do a good job of asking everybody that i sit down with and Really, I think it's just getting the affirmative that it was a valuable use of their time. So typically at the end of a meeting, I'll you know, ask them, hey, what, what difference did you find in going through this process? Because most of the clients that I work with now have already sat down with someone in the past or they have an old advisor. Um, and so I'll ask them, what, what difference did you find? And they'll usually say something. And I say, great, you know, like I'd love to share this difference with someone that you care about. Um, you know, who are, you know, and here's really what I'm looking for. I'll give them the parameters. You know, they make X amount. They're in these industries. They care about their families. They have good values. Um, you know, who are, who are three or four guys you know, that come to mind that fit this profile that I can reach out to? Whether or not they're interested, that's irrelevant. But we'd love to at least reach out and see if we can be resourced and you know, leave it up to them if they want to chat. You know, I, I love about that is first, you were humble enough to say that you were not that great asking for referrals because to have – the success that you've had, there would be people who would be like, you know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the best. And I think that uh, that's a, a different mentality when you're willing to admit that there's an area where you can still improve, especially when we're talking, talking on a platform like this, like that's a, that's a big deal. And I, I applaud you for saying that that's, that's rad. 
And I think at the end of the day, it's something that you can always work on, right? And, and I think the, the important thing you said is that you always ask with anybody that you sit down with. Because I think it's very easy to forget or to get scared to ask or there are all the things that can happen in between. So you may not necessarily need to have the best language. As long as you ask, then you may be able to get referrals anyways. And that's where the difference is. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a funny story. And I don't know if I should be sharing this, but uh, I'm going to. So there's when you start in this industry with my company specifically, and you know, probably every company, but this company, there's a two week sales school, they call it, where really you learn, it's like drinking through a fire hose. You learn a bunch of information about everything. Um, and a lot of the advisors get asked to go speak at those sales school to teach language or to teach you know, processes. Um, and I always get asked to go speak for certain things. And I usually don't, but um, I was asked to speak one time on referrals and like referral language and prospecting. And one of our other advisors in the office, who's a little bit older than me, said, hey, Johnny shouldn't be doing that. His language is terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I started laughing and I replied back. I said, that's spot on. My language is probably the worst. So maybe don't teach it. But my mindset is I, it doesn't matter. You know, my language is not the best and I could improve it, which I'm trying to. But it doesn't matter. I, I thoroughly believe that. I'm the best at what I do and I can be a good resource. And if you're not introducing me, then that's selfish of you because you're hiding something that's really valuable and important in your life. Why would you not want to share that with your best friend? Do you not care about him? No, I would never say it like that, but that's really my mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's so important because even if it's not just asking for referrals, right, it's like on the phone, it's in-person meetings because we're, we're always in this sort of scenario wanting to come off, as the expert and the best so things like stuttering and not knowing your verbiage i think at the end of the day making the action and just doing it anyway is not worth trying to worry about how you're going to sound at the end of the day and I'm, you may be able to relate to this there are so many times where you got off the phone with somebody that is moving forward to the next steps and you're like god i sounded like crap and that person is still moving to the next place in the process you're like you know what like at the end of the day, it really does not matter as much exactly what I say. I'd say that's 80% of my clients that do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, how are you guys working with me? But again, it goes back to, I think, you know, that phrase, like people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Like that's super applicable to what we do. You know, and I, I think, you know, I am good at what I do and I do know a lot, but there's certain things that I don't know. And if I don't know it, I'll go find the answer for them. And they know that, you know, I care about them. And that's, that's really what, I think why they, people decide to work with my team. Yeah. Well, I, I love the fact that you say you'll go find the answer if you don't have it, because that's such an important thing for anybody who's got to do customer service with the people that they sign up for their respective offerings. So when it comes to customer service, other than going out of the way, which is great, what other things have you utilized to kind of help you to keep a lot of the clients that you have that could be useful for folks out there? Uh, well, we do, so we do semi-annual reviews. So we do like a formal, like once a year review to update their plan. And then typically every six months, we'll take them out for you know their birthday or we'll grab a beer. Um, I do little client appreciation events, like I'll throw a little, you know, a happy hour, um, for folks or, you know, like a mini golf tournament or something stupid like that. Um, you know, I try to surf with my clients, whatever's relevant for them. And I'm probably not going to spend time with my worst clients. It's going to be the client, you know, the top 20% that I really pursue and try to make a relationship with those. Cause those are the people that value our work. You know, the, the people that, you know, maybe they buy a product or, you know, I call them buyers versus planners, you know, mm -hmm. there's people that will buy a couple of products or, you know, something, but then we never talk to them again. That's not a good relationship. The people I want to work with are, you know, the planners, the people that care about, you know, the relationship and value what we do and our expertise moving forward. So I would say as far as, you know, appreciation or just events, um, I think it's anything that can help build your relationship with your clients. So, like tomorrow night, I'm going out. I have a young couple taking me out for a birthday dinner. And my birthday was last month, but, you know, they wanted to take me out. So this is the night we're doing it. And it's, it's just like that. I mean, I know that, if, you know, 
we're going to have that birthday dinner and have a good time and they're not going to go anywhere. You know? Right. Well, I think that's such a big differentiator, right? Cause on, on either side of that coin, if you're just taking someone out for like fun for a beer or for coffee or whatever, and they may not be a client right now. Right. Or they may, they may not be someone that's interested in your services. However, by you just showing genuine interest in someone else, which is where I think this is going, you, they can end up becoming a client because they see that you're different from the other people who are out there that are just trying to sell them something and don't care if they can't sell them something. They're not interested in building a relationship. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So those are all great, great takeaways. I mean, you know, multi-million dollar nuggets laying in there. So Johnny, what parting words of, of wisdom or strategies would you like to leave the audience with today as we wrap up? Yeah, you know, I don't have, I have a lot to learn. I mean, I'm only 26, so I have a ton of years ahead of me to learn. Um, but I'd say, you know, for the last three years in building, you know, this business that I've been building, I, I'd say my biggest takeaways or advice I can give to other guys in certain industries are, you know, work hard is number one, um, have a vision of where you're going is number two, and then be coachable, be open to learning. Um, uh, you know, even if you think you're the best, you might be, but there's going to be someone in the room that can help you out. And you know, even if it's one small nugget or one takeaway, that's, you know, going to help you in your practice it's worth listening to. So I say those are probably the biggest things. And then find, find a group of people that are like-minded. I think, you know, I, I look at my high school and college friend group and really where they're at now and, you know, to each his own. But, um, my, my friend group now is, you know, my Bible study guys and some of my good clients. And those are the guys that, that I want to be, you know, that I want to be like in the next five, 10 years. So, so that's another big one for me. Yeah. Yeah, sure, man. And, and, and again, that's all great stuff. I, I really appreciate having you on the show today. I'm going to have links to some of the materials that he mentioned, like the defining decade on uh, this is going to go on, on Facebook. It's going to end up on my website, which is www.radical like R A D I C A L sales coaching.com against radical sales coaching dot Com. It's going to be on YouTube as well. Radical Sales Coaching, Lucas, Fara, Bees and Boy, A's and Aaron, RRA, and Johnny Searles. A pleasure breaking it down with you, sir, and looking forward to talking again soon. Absolutely. No, thanks for having me. This was fun. And you know, good luck, everybody. Keep your head up and uh, get that vision written down. Yeah, there, there we go. Love it. Take care, everybody. Stay closing.